So we are going to talk about primitive roots and prove that every prime number has at least one primitive root. To do that, we're going to use something called Lagrange's theorem, which has to do with the number of solutions to polynomial congruences, meaning congruences where the thing we're looking at here is a polynomial in some variable like x. If you aren't familiar with Lagrange's theorem, there's a video linked in the description that explains what it is and also goes through a derivation. So you can check that out and then come back here. The way that we're going to start talking about primitive roots is with an identity that at first seems completely unrelated, but it's going to be a key part of the proof. So I'm going to derive that first, and that's going to give us the baseline that we need to actually talk about the existence of primitive roots. Let's take a look at this polynomial that we have right here. x to the power of p minus one minus one. Now we know that if p is an odd prime number, so any prime number greater than two, we can write p minus one as a product of two numbers. Let's call those numbers d and c. So we can say this is equal to x to the power of dc minus one. And we can also say that x to the dc is x to the d and then to the power of c. What we're going to do here is use the difference of powers formula. So x to the d to the c minus 1, we can factor as x to the d minus 1. So that's this inside term here, x to the d minus 1, and then times 1 plus x to the d plus x to the d squared, which would be x to the 2d plus x to the 3d, and so on, all the way up to x to the c minus 1d. So this is just taking the expression that we have over here and factoring it in terms of x to the d as our variable. Now from here, we're going to take a look at a polynomial congruence. In particular, let's consider the congruence x to the p minus 1 minus 1 is congruent to 0 mod p. Now by Fermat's little theorem, we know that as long as x is not a multiple of p, this congruence is going to have p minus 1 solutions. And those solutions are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to p minus 1. We know that x to the p minus 1 minus 1 is the same as this product that we see over here. So if this congruence here has p minus 1 solutions, then when we set this product to be congruent to 0 mod p, this also has to have p minus 1 solutions. Now you might remember from your basic algebra classes that if we have a product of two different expressions being equal to 0, then one of the factors in the product has to be equal to zero. We can say the same thing when we're looking at congruences. If we have a product of two different expressions being congruent to zero mod a prime number p, only if it's prime, then we know one of these two numbers has to be congruent to zero mod p. That means that we can split up this congruence right here into two congruences, either x to the d minus 1 is congruent to 0 mod p, or this expression right here, 1 plus all the way up to x to the c minus 1d, is congruent to 0 mod p. So one of these two congruences has to be true. First, we're going to take a look at the congruence over here. And this is where we use Lagrange's theorem. If we take a look at the exponent of this highest order term here, x to the c minus 1 times d, we know c minus 1 times d, that's going to be c times d minus d, if we just distribute this out. Now c times d was defined to be p minus 1. So we can write this as p minus 1 and then minus d. So this is the exponent of the highest order term in this congruence over here. And Lagrange's theorem says that if we have a polynomial congruence with order p minus 1 minus d, then this congruence can have at most this number of solutions. 
So the highest number of solutions that this congruence over here can have is p minus 1 minus d. We can do the exact same thing for the congruence that we see over here. With the polynomial x to the d minus 1, obviously the order of that polynomial is going to be d. So Lagrange's theorem says that this polynomial congruence has at most d solutions. So let's think about what these two facts mean in the context of our original polynomial congruence. We showed earlier that this congruence over here is equivalent to either the left congruence or the right congruence being true. It's equivalent to at least one of these being true. We know that the congruence over here has p minus 1 solutions. So since these two are equivalent, these two congruences together have to have p minus 1 solutions. So if we take the number of solutions on the left and add the number of solutions on the right, we need to get p minus 1. So let's think about the maximum number of solutions that these two congruences together could have. We know that the left congruence has at most d solutions, and the right congruence has at most p minus 1 minus d solutions. If we take those two maximum numbers and add them together, notice we get d minus d here, and we're left with p minus 1. What that's saying is the maximum number of solutions that these two congruences together can have is p minus 1. So the only way for these two to be equivalent is if they both have the maximum number of solutions. And one of the implications of that is that this polynomial congruence right here, x to the d minus 1 is congruent to 0 mod p, that needs to have exactly d solutions. Now the initial condition on the number d was that it had to be some factor of p minus 1 because we defined p minus 1 to be equal to d times c. So we know that this is true if d divides p minus 1. So as long as d is a divisor of p minus 1, this congruence has exactly d solutions. And that's the result that we need to start looking at primitive roots. So let's start by looking at the definition of a primitive root. A primitive root mod p is some number x, some integer, such that the order of x mod p is p minus 1. In fact, p minus 1 is the highest possible order that a number can have because we know by Fermat's little theorem that x to the p minus 1 is always congruent to 1 mod p. So what we want to prove is that every single prime number p has some primitive root, some number with this property. And our proof is going to be constructive. In other words, we're going to show what that primitive root would look like. In order to do that, we're going to start by looking at p minus 1. We know that p minus 1 is going to have some prime factorization. Even if it's a prime number, we could factor it into, of course, itself being a prime. But we could write it as p1 to the a1 times p2 to the a2 times p3 to the a3, and so on. Now I'm going to propose a few numbers that will be important to our proof. Let's first look at a number x1. And x1 is some number such that the order of x1 mod p is equal to p1 to the a1. We're also going to have some number x2. So the order of x2 mod p is p2 to the a2. And we're going to do the same thing with p3 to the a3 and p4 to the a4 and so on. For each one of these prime powers, we're going to suppose that there is some number x where the order of x is that prime power. If we can do that for every single one of the prime powers, we can do something very interesting. Remember that when we're looking at orders mod p, if we have two orders, the order of two different numbers, x1 and x2, and these values are coprime, then when we take the order of x1 times x2, we can multiply the results that we had from before. But because p1 and p2 are distinct primes, p1 to the a1 is going to be coprime to p2 to the a2. They won't share any factors. And that means that we can say the order 
of x1, x2 mod p is going to be p1 to the a1 times p2 to the a2. And we can do this exact same reasoning for an arbitrary number of prime powers. So if we're looking at p1 having some prime factorization, if we can find some numbers x sub i where the order of that number equals each prime power, what we can do is multiply x1 times x2 times x3 and so on. And that product is going to have an order mod p of p1 to the a1 times p2 to the a2 and so on. In other words, it's going to have an order of p minus 1. What that's telling us is all we need to do is show that for any power of a prime number, we can find some x where the order of x mod p is the power of that prime number. Once we do that, we can repeat that process for every number in the prime factorization of p minus 1, multiply them, and that gives us our answer. So here on the board, I've written the only thing that we have left to prove in order to show every prime number has a primitive root. We need to show that for any power of a prime number, say q, there exists some x where the order of x mod p is q to the power of a. So let's take a look at what this means. If the order of x mod p is q to the power of a, we know that x to the power of q to the a has to be congruent to 1 mod p. And one of the properties of the order of x mod p that we derived in the previous video is that if we have a congruence where x to some power is congruent to 1 mod p, then we know that the order of x mod p has to divide this exponent, q to the a. In other words, q to the a has to be some multiple of the order of x mod p. Now because q to the a is the power of a prime number, there are only a few numbers that can be divisors of q to the a. And those numbers are 1, q, q squared, q cubed, q to the fourth, and so on, all the way up to q to the a minus 1 and q to the a. This is because q is a prime number. So, if the order of x mod p has to divide q to the a, then the order of x mod p has to be one of these numbers. Now we're going to take a look at what would happen if the order of x mod p were one of the numbers in here that's not q to the a. So if the order of x mod p were somewhere in this list, excluding q to the a. Then, first of all, notice that q to the a minus 1 is a multiple of all of these numbers in here. For any number, say q to the k, we can write q to the a minus 1 as q to the k times q to the a minus 1 minus k. So this will be possible for any of the multiples in here. What that's telling us is that if the order of x mod p is one of these numbers in here, and if q to the a minus 1 is a multiple of those numbers, then we know x to the power of q to the a minus 1 has to be congruent to 1 mod p. What this is essentially saying is that if the order is in this set, then q to the a minus 1 represents an integer number of cycles through that order. And therefore, at the end, we have to get a result congruent to 1 mod p. So if we want the order of x mod p to not be any of the numbers in here, then we need to have x to the power of q to the a minus 1 being not congruent to 1 mod p. So if x to the power of q to the a minus 1 is not congruent to 1 mod p, then by the contrapositive, we can show that the order of x mod p is not any of the numbers in this set. And therefore, the only remaining possibility is that it's q to the a. So we've reduced our problem. In order to show that there's some number with the order of x mod p being q to the a, all we have to do is show that there is some number x where these two congruences are satisfied 
And now this is the part where the result that we proved at the beginning is going to come in handy. Remember that q to the a is not just some power of any prime number. It's actually a specific type. q to the a is one of the divisors of p minus 1. We took that number out of the prime factorization of p minus 1. And the result that we proved at the beginning says that if we have some number that divides p minus 1, then the congruence x to that power minus 1 is congruent to 0 mod p. That has exactly q to the a solutions. The number of solutions is exactly the exponent of this polynomial here. So we know that the top congruence here, q to the a divides p minus 1. Therefore, this congruence is going to have q to the a solutions. On the other hand, this congruence down here, if we instead of looking at it being not congruent to 1, suppose we look at x to the q to the a minus 1 is congruent to 1. In that case, this congruence down here is going to have q to the a minus 1 solutions. Again, it's just that exponent there. So if we want the number of solutions where x is congruent in the first but not the second, the number of solutions is q to the a, number of solutions to this first congruence, minus q to the a minus 1, number of solutions to the second congruence. And we can factor this as q to the a minus 1 times q minus 1. And the important thing to note is that this number is always positive for any prime power. And what that's telling us is that the number of integers x that satisfy the first congruence and not the second congruence is positive. There exists at least one number x with that property. In other words, there exists at least one number x where the order of x mod p is equal to q to the a. And that's all we need to show that every prime number has a primitive root. So let's do a quick review of the proof that we just went through. We started by taking that order that we were trying to get, p minus 1, and looking at its prime factorization. If we could find some number where the order of x1, x2, and so on equals each of these prime powers, because each of these is coprime, when we multiply all the x1, x2, x3, and so on, what we get is the prime factorization for p minus 1. That means we can reduce our problem to just looking at does there exist some x with the order of x mod p equal to q to the a, anytime that's in the prime factorization of p minus 1. That means we have to show that there exists a solution, some number x, where this first congruence is true and the second congruence is not. Based on the result that we proved at the beginning, this first congruence has q to the a solutions and the second congruence has q to the a minus 1 solutions. Since q to the a is always bigger than q to the a minus 1, that means there does exist some x where the first congruence is true but not the second, and therefore the order of x mod p is q to the a. And that means that for every single prime number, there always exists some integer where the order of that integer mod p is equal to p minus 1.